distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Ekapon Jongvilewan. I'm the senior economist uh, from public sector management and governance uh, sector group of ADB. Um, welcome all of you to ADB IEA, International Economic Association Innovative Policy Research Session. Uh, as a start of the program, uh, uh, I would like to uh, uh, present a welcome message from Professor Elhanan Helpman, uh, Galen L. Stone Professor of International Trade Department of Economics, Harvard University, and the President of International Economic Association. Um, uh, please uh, uh, present the welcome message from Professor Elhanan. Mr. Ramesh Subramanian, Mr. Mr. Albert Park, Mr. Emmanuel Jimenez, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On behalf of the ADB IEA Innovative Policy Research Award Committee, I have great pleasure to warmly welcome you to this awarding session of the 57th ADB Incheon Annual Meeting. Today's session is the fruit of a long-standing collaboration between the Asian Development Bank and the International Economic Association. Our partnership began in 2021 when ADB President Masa Asakawa launched the joint ADB IEA Innovative Policy Research Award during the opening panel on Asian and global policy issues of the IEA World Congress. The ADBIA Innovative Policy Research Award emanated from the need to embrace academic research for policy design in response to complex development challenges, such as income inequality, global economic uncertainty, and climate change. Typically, it takes months, if not years, for policymakers and development partners to formulate policies based on new research. To catalyze policy to address these emerging challenges, the ADB IEA Innovative Policy Research Award was established as an enabling mechanism to bring cutting edge research closer to policy recommendations. The ADB IEA Innovative Policy Research Award aims to stimulate the use of empirical research to support evidence-based policies. Following the launch, ADB and IEA successfully convened the inaugural ADB IEA Innovative Policy Research Award in 2022, followed by the second undertaking last year. Today's session is the third undertaking. In October 2023, IEA and ADB made a call for papers. We deliberately did not place constraints on topics, but we did point the researchers to ADB's operational priorities on addressing poverty and inequality, accelerating progress in gender equality, tackling climate, change, making cities more livable, promoting rural development and food security, strengthening governance and institutional capacity, and regional cooperation and integration. We were delighted to receive over 100 original papers by researchers from across the world. In March 2024, the selection committee met to deliberate on the winners. The committee included Professor Gordon Hanson, Professor Etisham Ahmad, Professor Fukunari Kimura, and ADB representative Ramash Subramanian, ADB's Director General and Chief Sectors Group, and Sona Shresta, Deputy Director General of ADB's Independent Evaluation Department. Given the quality of the submissions, the committee had to make tough choices. In addition to selecting the three winning papers, the committee decided to also acknowledge an additional seven papers 
as honorable mentions for their excellence. In conclusion, let me congratulate the authors of the three winning papers and seven honorable mentions. I would also like to thank the more than 100 researchers who submitted their papers to the ADBIA Innovative Research Award and the IA and ADB teams who managed the entire process. Special thanks to the former IA president, then Professor Kaushik Basu and Professor five selection committee members. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite Mr. Ramesh Subramaniam, Director General and Chief Sector Group, to do a welcome message on behalf of ADB IEA Selection Committee. Thank you so much, Ekapol. Uh, it's a lot more fun to hear from the, uh, the three researchers, so I'll keep my remarks very, very simple. And also, Professor Helpman gave a fantastic overview. We are delighted that we came up with this idea a few years ago, 2019, 2020, and then the pandemic came. Uh, but the idea was actually a small seed at the time, that what can we do, how can we partner with an institution like the IEA? At that time, IEA was going to hold its uh, conference in um, uh, Bali, uh, in uh, Indonesia. Uh, so that idea, we are delighted just looking back. You know, sometimes you come up with these ideas and they take a life of their own. Uh, we are delighted that we, we, we've come up with this and uh, we are committed uh, on the part of ADB uh, to continue supporting this because it's so important for us to be uh, glued together with um, researchers, with uh, academic institutions, with uh, various networks and so on. Uh, this is very much a collaborative effort between the sectors group in ADB, uh, the independent evaluation department led by Manny Jimenez, uh, our economics and research department led by Dr. Albert Park, and also very happy that the dean of the ADB Institute, Sanabe San, is here. So we, we work a lot together. You know, Asia and the Pacific, needless to say, faces lots and lots of development challenges, but it's also a region full of opportunities. A few years ago, in fact, actually, the year when we started thinking about this, uh, we had a high-level panel with some of the finance ministers, and one finance minister, I might have said this, by the way, in the last year's seminar as well, but let me, let me say it. One finance minister said, you know, we face lots and lots of new problems and challenges. I don't want the same old solutions. I want new and innovative solutions. And in fact, uh, the, uh, the key driver behind the new operating model in ADB is that spirit of innovation. Uh, so we have four shifts in the new operating model. We call uh, them the climate shift, private sector development shift, solutions shift, and partnership shift. Uh, and one thing that is common across all of these is the need for innovation. And, and countries need, particularly as they are moving uh, ahead in the post-pandemic context, recovery is there, it's happening, uh, but probably not robust and sustained. Some countries are doing very well, others are still facing challenges, whether it's on the fiscal front or, or in some of the other sectors that we are dealing with. Uh, so we are delighted that, uh, that um, the, the uh, IEA collaboration is continuing. As Professor Helpman um, noted very nicely, uh, we got um, tremendous interest when we announced this. And uh, as I noted, we will continue and we hope next year and the following year we will get uh, even more. Uh, with that, let me thank again, as, as again Professor Helpman said, uh, the IEA leadership. Uh, we collaborated with them very, very closely. Uh, Professor Helpman, as well as the previous chairs, uh, Danny Roderick and uh, Kaushik Basu, uh, and also the selection panel uh, that worked with us in identifying the uh, awardees. So with that, let me pause. Thank you, and we'll be delighted to hear from the researchers themselves. Thank you so much. Next, uh, this is the moment. Uh, I have a pleasure uh, to invite uh, Mr. Manny uh, Jimenez, Director General of ADB Independent Evaluation Department, to make uh, the official announcement of the winners for 2024 ADB IEA Innovative Policy Research Award. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, thanks very much. Um, it's a real pleasure uh, to uh, be able to uh, 
give out these awards. Uh, it's not very often that uh, independent evaluation uh, in which reports to the board on how ADB is doing has such a popular uh, task to perform. So I'm uh, very, very happy that I'm able to do this uh, today. Uh, just one word on how, why we think that this is so critical. Just in the past uh, day and a half of these meetings, I think if there's one message that's coming through is that the constraints to development in our developing member countries is not only finance. In fact, in some of the uh, countries that we deal with, especially the middle income countries, is not about finance at all. The biggest constraint to development is ideas and capacity. And that's why I think that this is such a terrific forum and initiative on the part of ADB and IEA to be able to try and uh, address this constraint. So uh, I want to express my uh, sincere congratulations to uh, the winners. Uh, unlike in the Oscars, it, this is not going to be a surprise, uh, and uh, the, all the nominees were not invited. Only the winners were invited to this event. But the first award, uh, oh, wait a minute, I was supposed to actually tell you how hard it was for them to get this award. Can somebody uh, put up? Okay. So, uh, as Professor Helpman uh, mentioned in his opening remarks, there was a very august uh, selection committee that was very tough, very rigorous. You see a couple of them here today uh, that selected, uh, received over 150 papers over a wide range of subjects. Uh, and you can see exactly uh, what they did. And the criteria was the relevance of the problem, structure and presentation, the quality of the methodology and analysis, and the operational applicability. So you can see it's not just about did you get your uh, methods correct and were you at the cutting edge. It's really about how helpful were you to the developing member countries and the poor people whom we are trying, whose needs we're trying to address. Uh, the uh, Shortlisted papers are, are ranked based on average scores and then provided by the selection uh, committee. Uh, and uh, the awards were given to the top three research papers who uh, each won a $7,000 research grant. Don't spend all in one place. Uh, and I'm very happy to announce uh, who they are. Uh, the first award winner uh, goes to Dr. Claire Cullen. Uh, come on up, Claire. Uh, Claire is Head of Research and Innovation of Youth uh, Impact, and her co-authors, uh, you just have to bear with me the minute, uh, she had a lot of co-authors with this, uh, Noam Angrist of Oxford, uh, Michael uh, Ainemogisha, Ain uh, Renee Marion Pant of IPA, Shwetlana Sabarwal of the World Bank, Tim Sullivan of New Globe, uh, Sai Pramod Batena of Aloket, uh, Peter Bergman of U UT at Austin, Colin Crossley of Youth Impact, Thato Somo of Youth Impact, and Mochepi Matsheng of Youth Impact for their paper, Building Resilient Education Systems, Evidence from Large-Scale Randomized Trials in Five Countries. So, congratulations. The uh, second uh, award winner is uh, Professor Abu Shanchoy of Florida International University. So his co-authors include uh, Tomoko Fuji of SMU, uh, Christine Ho of SMU, uh, Rohan Ray of National University of Singapore for their paper, School Attendance Information or Conditional Cash Transfers, Evidence from a Randomized Field Experiment in Rural Bangladesh. Congratulations, Abu. And the uh, third award winner is Dr. Dongjing Wang of Chinese University of Hong Kong, uh, uh, who, with her co-author Eddie Zhou of the LSE and Institute for Fiscal Studies for their paper titled Public Wash Programs, Long-Run Child Development and Intergenerational Mobility, New Evidence from Rural China. Congratulations, Dongjing. Before we proceed, may I call on uh, DG Ramesh uh, and uh, Mr. Albert Park uh, for a group photo with the award winners. Thank you.
Okay. Now uh, we move on to um, the presentation of the, the three awards uh, winner. We will hear from them uh, the interesting research findings um, and how they would uh, recommend to ADB how we are going to apply the key research findings uh, to our uh, main operations uh, in Asia and the Pacific. Um, uh, as a start, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Claire Cullen uh, to present uh, her paper on building resilient education system evidence from large-scale randomized trial in five countries. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks everybody else for having done all the hard yards of the introduction with all those words and all of my co-authors. So uh, my name is Claire Cullen uh, and it's a pleasure to be here speaking with you about my research with my 10 amazing co-authors. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about education in emergencies. So the key thing I want you to take from this figure is that education emergencies are really common and they're really costly. So I've been reading about Philippines over the past few days, how schools have been closed because of the extreme heat. And this is the kind of phenomenon that's going to be happening increasingly with climate change. And you can see this here, that these kinds of emergencies span from uh, earthquakes that end up closing schools or foot and mouth disease, um, cyclones, these kinds of things. Uh, and so over 2 billion people in the world live in countries that end up getting uh, schools closed because of school disruption from emergencies. And these things, as I mentioned, span from natural disasters, pollution, elections, teacher strikes. Uh, in recognition of the scale of this problem, the UN has established a global fund um, to help children who are faced by school closures. Uh, and this is estimated to affect 222 million children. Yet in spite of the scale of this issue, there is limited experimental evidence on education in emergencies. So we have this large literature on the large cost of school disruption to student learning, and yet there's less evidence on way to stem these learning losses. Uh, and this does relate to a, a literature that's growing in conflict settings, and also an emerging literature on learning losses during COVID. So what did we do to study this issue? So a lot of you might be familiar if you know education at all. Uh, a program is called Teaching at the Right Level. There's a lot of randomized control trials from multiple contexts showing that it's very effective. So the key principles of teaching at the right level is that you take kids who a lot of them are like the curriculum is going above their head because they've missed some foundational skills at the beginning. So they've missed these like building blocks. So you go, you work out what level they actually know and you teach them in a short remedial program the, the like basic foundational numeracy and literacy skills that they don't know. So during COVID, so I worked with a, an, an NGO based in Botswana, uh, and they, in the face of COVID, when schools were closed and children could no longer go to school, they adapted this teaching at the right level program that's normally done in person to being able to be delivered over the phone. And so this, the key principle still applied. So you, uh, the phone intervention essentially is making an initial phone call, assessing the student what level they know. Do they know addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division? And then delivering weekly phone calls uh, as a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session to give them targeted instruction. And it's about eight weeks long, uh, and it also involves a weekly SMS. And so what are the kind of mechanisms that underpin why this kind of program might be effective? And so we've borrowed from the teaching at the right level uh, phrase to identify the two key pillars that we think matter. So platform and pedagogy. So we think that unlike a lot of other uh, ed tech programs, maybe that rely on online or tablets, uh, most people have access to a phone. Even if it's not directly in their household, they know somebody who has access to a phone. Uh, and so it's widely available platform. And then in terms of pedagogy, we want a teaching at the right level. Um, so instruction is targeted to the student's individual learning level, uh, and it's one-on-one. -on -one and there's decent evidence that both of these approaches are really important. So what happened during this first Botswana pilot was a randomized control trial that was done in early 2020, so from April to August of 2020. Uh, and it found that the program was very effective. So it was over 0.1 standard deviations, which is generally in education literature considered a very effective education program. The median education randomized control trial finds that uh, 0.1 standard deviations is the standard improvement. Um, and so then once this program was 
uh, tested in Botswana and the evidence started disseminating, then a lot of other organizations and NGOs and governments uh, and institutions were contacting this Botswana organization and wanting to try it out in their context. And so we partnered with organizations and governments around the world in five countries to test it out. So here's the timeline. So the initial Botswana trial was in um, 2020, and then that was closely followed by randomized control trials we conducted in Kenya, uh, followed by Nepal, India, Philippines, and Uganda. And these were conducted with a mixture of uh, governments, as I mentioned, NGOs, uh, and the World Bank. So what are some of the key components across these diverse settings? So it was generally targeted to where the curriculum in schools is covering this content of foundational numeracy skills. So by grades four in most countries, students know division. And so that's around the, the grade range that we were um, targeting. Uh, in all five countries, we had a treatment arm that involved this phone call and SMS. But in four out of the five contexts, we also tried an, just a weekly SMS, because obviously if that was effective, that would be an extremely scalable, cost-effective program. Uh, in terms of implementer, uh, as I mentioned, there's a, a range. In two countries, in Nepal and the Philippines, we were able to randomly assign students to, be, uh, to have their tutor as either a government school teacher or an NGO implementer, so that we could test the effectiveness of these two implementer types. Uh, and in terms of implementation, as I mentioned, it's generally an eight-week program. So in all these contexts, there was like pretty broad geographic spread. In all of these countries, schools were disrupted in and out a little bit, mixed support um, during school closures. Uh, and then common programming, but there was space for obviously translation into the local um, languages. Uh, in some places, like place value was taught a little differently, so there were minor changes to the program, but generally common programming. As I mentioned, the NGO and government delivery and a very successful, for a phone interview, re-interview rate of 78%, and this was balanced across arms. So what are the results of the program? So let's first start looking at the two red bars. So as I mentioned, point one standard deviations is generally considered very effective in education. And so you can see the SMS program caused a 0.8 standard deviation improvement in learning, which is not too bad for a very, very cheap program. Uh, but uh, the red bar shows a 0.327 standard deviation improvement in learning for students who get the phone call and the SMS, which puts it in some of the most cost-effective education programs out there. Um, and this is obviously conducted during a, an extreme emergency event where a lot of students are not getting education um, when schools are closed, but this is a really effective uh, outcome. And then if we look at the green bars, this shows us the results from just Nepal and the Philippines where we had that implementer randomization. And so you can see from the two right green bars that NGO implementers and then government implementers are equally effective. So students who learn from both of them benefit just as much. What else do we know? So drilling down just to one particular country and one particular operation, uh, you can, this result shows the share of students in Uganda in grade four on the left and five on the right who got division correct. And so one thing to take away from this chart is that the control group has learning losses from baseline to end line. So you can see the like, left set of two bars in each of, the, each of the graphs, it goes down because these control students are forgetting what they knew at baseline in this three-month gap between the surveys. Next, we find that the program fully recovers these learning losses. So you can see the purple bar on the right is, like, uh, goes above what students are forgetting. So it's recovering this learning loss. And then it's also like, going well beyond. So it's the gains are dwarfing what students are learning from, from that. And then another key thing to note is you can see, it's, I think I can't see super well, but 17 percentage points. So 17 percent of kids in grade four can get division correct. And I think that goes up to 21 percent of kids in grade five. So kids are learning very little year on year in school. And this purple bar is like well superseding what kids are learning in a typical school year. So everybody wants to know what the results are by country. So you can see them here in the, the uh, bottom set shows the phone call and SMS. So you can see a lot of stars there, which is uh, signifying that these are standard statistically significant results. So the key gist here is that the phone call and SMS is effective in all five countries. 
but the SMS messages you'll see, they're only effective in Nepal and the, Fil and, sorry, in the Philippines and Uganda. And there could be a few reasons for that. One key probable factor is that uh, the Philippines and Uganda had some of the world's longest school closures. And so there, when the like, counterfactual is so bad and kids have forgotten so much, just sending SMSs was effective. So what, why did this work? This is very unusual that it's uh, such a large effect. So we think a key part is that it's reaching students at the right level. So it's reaching them on a platform that they find useful, it's not like a lot of households have access to, to the phones, uh, unlike we found like maximum 30% of kids in Uganda uh, out of all the contexts were accessing other like online resources, radio or television. So this is getting something that households have access to and find useful. So for example, we find really high consent rate, uh, weekly response rate is like the share of households answering, uh, picking up the phone is between 70 and 80%, and almost all households who consented uh, accepted at least one phone call during the program. Um, we also ask at Endline, almost 100% of households say that they want the program to continue, including control households would be interested, and uh, there's an increase in the willingness to pay for this program. We also think that a key underpinning is, is um, the teaching at the right level. And so one bit of evidence for this is we find that when we look at heterogeneous treatment effects, we find that the program is equally effective regardless of what level you started out as. So the program is just as effective if you started out at multiplication as if you started out at, at addition level. And that's, that suggests that's exactly what targeting is meant to do. It's like working out what kids know and then working from that. Um, we also have other evidence consistent with this where we find that when we track uh, impact over time and we track targeting of students lessons to their individual level we find that these track each other and so that does suggest again that this increasing ta um, targeting is really key for increasing um, impact so of course everyone's a little skeptical of phone-based surveys for for some good reasons so we wanted to be very sure that we believed these results because they are conducted over the phone uh, when students are at home, typically. And so we conducted a number of robustness tests. So for example, we assign, randomly assign students um, to do the survey in person and on the phone, and we find the same impacts. We also find the same impacts when students are retested using back checks, uh, the same impacts when students are randomly assigned to different problems with the same level of difficulty. So it's not based on like the particular question that we asked in the survey. Uh, and then we also find no impact on an effort task. And so the fact that students are not like differentially trying harder in the treatment group suggests that it's real learning that's happening. It's not just like trying a bit harder. So what have I shown you? In conclusion, I've shown you results from a large scale randomized control trial in five countries evaluating the effect of a phone based education program. Um, despite these really different contexts, we find really consistent, robust, positive results across all five countries. Um, at 0.3 standard deviations. So suggesting that these kinds of phone call programs can work across contexts. We find similar effects when we randomized whether the implementer was NGO or government, which suggests, again, like it's likely to be taken up successfully um, in the face of a few differences. And we find this program is also extremely cost effective. It delivers up to four years of high quality schooling uh, per hundred dollars, which puts it in the top echelon of cost effective education programs. We found also possible mechanisms suggesting why this works is its um, pedagogy and its platform. And so what are we doing now that we've done this given the, the request to make a bit of a pitch in case people wanna work with us or um, are interested in scaling this or testing this in other places? So we supported the IADB to run a bunch of tests in South America. We're now working with um, governments and NGOs and civil society in Afghanistan, um, Philippines Department of Education to scale it up, uh, MBHTE and BARM to scale this up, um, governments in uh, various states in India to scale it up. So there's a lot of interest uh, in this program. And so very happy to chat to others interested in trying it out. Um, and so we are also interested in testing to see, like, we have a lot of people asking us if this is just like generally useful. 
um, for remedial education. It's not just emergencies, and we think that that's, that certainly seems to be the case. It's still, it's currently being scaled up in Botswana. There's still a lot of household demand outside emergency contexts. Um, and yeah, uh, looking forward to hearing your questions. Thank you so much. Um, the next presenter uh, uh, will be uh, from uh, Professor Abu Chon Choi uh, from uh, uh, Florida International University. Uh, his paper really challenged us to rethink about the CCT program to look for more effective, more cost-effective options. Uh, without further ado, uh, Professor. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much for having me here and uh, really delighted to be the recipient of the ADB and IEA uh, uh, Innovative Policy Research Award. Uh, so this is a joint work with uh, uh, all, um, my four co-authors, uh, three co-authors, so uh, Setomoki Fuji and Christine Ho from Singapore National Singapore Management University and Rohan Ray from National University of Singapore. And what we are trying to do in this research is kind of fundamentally challenging the CCT literature and trying to see whether we can make an improvement in a cost-effective way. So, so those of us who know CCT literature, you know that this conditional cash transfer program, uh, what it was pioneered in Mexico uh, to encourage families to send kids to the school. So if you send your kid to the school based on school continuation and some level of 78 per 70 to 80% attendance, families will receive money. So that has been found to be very, very effective to encourage uh, families to, to bring kids back to the school and, and, and being tested in various different settings that this is a very, very uh, important and, and, and interesting way of encouraging uh, school attendance. And if you look into the CCT uh, revolution from 1997, uh, there was like three countries doing CCT for education. It has now moved to almost 50 countries worldwide, right? So government are spending a considerable amount of resources just to encourage families to send their kids to the school. Now, when we uh, look into the CCT literature, uh, one caveat that was found, which is the cost effectiveness of CCT, whether it is really the cost effective way of bringing kids to the school, or there are other ways we can do it, right? So in this research, we are fundamentally challenging it, and we are trying to see whether there are other ways to have similar effect. So what we have done in this research, we have the traditional CCT, but in the traditional CCT, the framing that the families are receiving is gain, right? So which is, if you send your child to school, you will gain money. But there is a recent literature in behavioral economics which focus on loss aversion. So human react more if there is a loss than gain. So we thought that what if we reframe it with the same amount of money, but we tell families, if you don't send your child, you lose money, right? So it's, it's the same amount of money, but the framing is different. We are using the, the modern development of uh, behavioral economics. And also we found that in the CCT framing, there is also two parts. One is the cash part, and one other part is the information part. Right? So in the high income countries, e school and like parents and teachers, there are a lot of communication. Like my, my daughter goes to school, I receive SMS almost every day that your child has done this, they attended the school, this is the score. In low income setting, there is hardly any communication from the school to the parents. So in the CCT, uh, when they are receiving money, they implicitly assume that my child must be going to the school. So we wanted to isolate the impact of information only versus cash. So the, in the information only, we will just tell the families the attendance information. And another one is attendance information with the cash to see how much we can gain just from the attendance information. 
So this is what we are trying to do in a unified setting. And, and this has never been tested in a unified setting where we change the, the CCD framing and also we just test the information of school attendance vis-a-vis -vis with, uh, with the CCD. Um, so it's, this is again uh, 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 a randomized control trial, which is now becoming a gold standard for any impact evaluation. So this randomized control trial has been done in Bangladesh, uh, which is a low-income country, and we recruited secondary education kids, which is which are like kids that are enrolled in grade six to grade nine, and and we ran this research for two years. Uh, and in the rural area. And so what we have done is there are four treatment arms, treatment control arm. So the first treatment is SMS. So SMS is just sending the school attendance information at the end of the school week. Say so for example, this week academic, academic curriculum is over. At the end of the week, families will receive an SMS saying that your child has attended out of five days of school, four days or three days, just uh, information in, in an SMS form. Of course, we are working in a low income setting and many families are illiterate. So just to cover the SMS, we also had this interactive voice response. It's a, it's a voice call, it's kind of robocall. Uh, so the robocall is a structured call <coughs> and, and that has the information in verbally. The second one is the information plus CCT information. <coughs> Excuse me. So in the, in, the, in the second group, we are giving them SMS, but the SMS also has additional information, which is giving you a balance of your cash transfer. And the, the third one is the, the loss, that how much money you have lost, and the status quo. <coughs> So, uh, so in this research, what we are trying to do is um, uh, address two important uh, literature in the research. One is reducing the information friction between families and school. And another one is trying to see whether the CCT is the most cost-effective way or whether we can find another cost-effective way uh, to bring the kids back to the school. Um, so before I show you the result, let me just quickly spend a, a few seconds on, on loss framing. So the loss framing has been on in prospect theory and other uh, behavioral economists has established that people and human react more towards loss than gain. So $1,000 loss will hit you more harder than $1,000 gain. And, and in the public policy literature, uh, there has not been any framing that used the loss. So this is one of the pioneer paper where we are trying to uh, introduce the loss aversion framing into a public transfer program. So this uh, work has been done in northern part of Bangladesh. And northern part of Bangladesh is notoriously poor and also have a very low literacy rate. <coughs> Um, so, uh, in terms of uh, the representation of the sample, uh, we are not taking any household that is uh, sending kids to the school. Our sample are those households that have a functional phone. Okay, so given the rise of phones in, in countries like Bangladesh, it was not very difficult to find families. We find 92% of the families, they have a functional phone. But imagine, uh, remember, these phones are not a smartphone or Apple phone. These are old style Nokia phones, right? The, the feature phones where they can receive SMSs and they can receive uh, uh, tax, uh, voice calls. So uh, just, uh, just to give you a, a highlight of the uh, information that we are giving, say for example, in the SMS group, uh, a, a standard text will look like this, that last week your child has attended X school days and missed Z school days, okay? And, and that's it, there's no conditionality enforced. But in the loss group, the SMS will look like the following. Last week your child has attended X school days and missed Z school days. You have lost TZ Taka, okay? So this loss part has been highlighted. So 
the, the, but there is a big challenge. So when we wanted to introduce it, uh, we face problem from the institutional review board and also we face an issue from the Ministry of Education in Bangladesh that you cannot give money and take money from them. That is not right. So what we have given them is a virtual account. So we say like, if your child goes all the days, then you're supposed to receive 500 virtual. And because your child has missed a few days, it is reducing. But we actually haven't given them the money. And also the public transfer program in Bangladesh and also other places, they don't give money each day. They transfer money end of a quarter. So, so we mimic that transfer mechanism. We distributed the money at the end of the quarter, but the balance is a virtual account balance. So we are telling them that you're supposed to receive this amount, your money is losing, but we are actually not, you know, taking the money back from the households. And, 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 and we thought that, is, that this is logical and more practical way of doing it. So as I mentioned, we are mimicking exactly the public transfer program in Bangladesh. So we did it in four phases. Each phase represents one quarter. The transfers are typically done on a quarterly basis. Um, and we also varied the CCT amount to see whether more money will generate more effect or there is a diminishing marginal return of this, this cash transfer program. And also we have been very, very rigorous in terms of attendance information. So in countries like Bangladesh, kids might come in the morning, but they might leave the school before uh, the, after the tiffin, right? So they come to the school in the morning, there is a lunch, and after the lunch, they will go back home or they will go to the field and play cricket, right? So we wanted to capture that. And so we have three different sources of attendance information. One is the morning attendance, which is the official record. The second one is a class representative will collect attendance after the lunch hour so that we can see whether they are still attending. And also we have random audit, random audit by our uh, uh, team members to see whether the, the records are correct or not. So we have a very, very rigorous data collection of the attendance. And, and what we found that the morning attendance and the afternoon attendance 90% time matches. So, so um, most of our results that I will present today is morning attendance, but in the main paper we have afternoon attendance plus the audit result attendance as well, but the results are pretty, pretty similar. Okay, so in terms of the impact, uh, so I would first uh, like you to look into the, the blue color one. So the first line, the first column is the gain, which is the traditional CCT. The second one is loss, which is the innovative CCT that we have tried. And the third one is just uh, information, okay? And let's look into the blue, which is all student. What you can see that uh, the CCT is very important that increases the attendance by 11.9 percentage, 11.5 percentage points. And in the loss framing has the highest magnitude, right? So when we, with the same amount of money, but we frame it differently with the loss, the impact magnitude goes up to 13.3 percentage points. And in the SMS where we haven't given any cash, just information itself, has about half of the effect. So if countries are struggling with uh, cash transfer program because it is costly, then just simple attendance information to the parents could generate half of the effect. And this is very powerful. And, and I think this is where we are trying to pitch. And I, I think uh, uh, many also requested, like what, what is the connection with ADP? We found that just simple attendance information generated to parents could generate half of the effect without any cash, okay? And, and then this is very, very powerful information. Now, what is a bit of negative side of our research? When we tested the statistical difference between gain and loss, they are not statistically significantly different from each other. Now, what is the problem? Why loss, which has been found in the prospect theory, is not reflected here? Why didn't we see loss aversion being more effective? So we tested the mechanism. So one is people, uh, because it's a low literacy setting, many families have different understanding of loss, and, and it's not systematic. The second problem is that uh, the discount rate of future 
amount because we are not actually giving money immediately. So there is a discount rate of future cash amount and then and that could be reflected. The third which we admitted is the endowment, the failure of endowment effect because we could not actually create an endowment effect. They are not receiving money and nobody is taking the money from them. So that's why the loss was not that effective. But in a real setting, if we can somehow innovatively do that, that money will be taken from you, we might see a, a bigger effect. Um, so given that the loss and gain was not statistically significantly different from each other, we collapsed loss and gain together and just we compared the CCT. So the rest of the discussion, I will just compare CCT with information. So the, this, this slide shows you the, the attendance information, the CCT and SMS. And as I mentioned, that the CCT impact is 12.4%, but SMS can generate about half of that effect. Okay, and the effect is much more pronounced for girls than boys. For boys, cash matters. For girls, even without cash, uh, information to the parents is, is very, very powerful. Um, we did a bunch of robustness checks in the main paper. We have it. I don't have time uh, to, to go over all these uh, robustness checks that we have done. Uh, so I will just highlight two additional things which are very, very important. One is aspiration, so which is our mechanism. We found that the SMS and CCT both can generate similar level of aspiration for the families. Okay, so it's not that the CCT provides more aspiration than SMS. Both can create similar level of aspiration. And we continue to collect data even our intervention is stopped. So one was... Uh, the, our main idea is if we stop CCT and if we stop SMS, what will happen to these families? So we kept on collecting data, even the intervention is stopped. And we found that both these impacts converged. So CCT and SMS both has the same effect post-intervention period. When the CCT is stopped, SMS is stopped, they both converge to 3.5 percentage point. And what was a very surprising find uh, in our research and which we wrote in our paper that we didn't anticipate this, which is a reduction in child marriage. So countries like Bangladesh, they face a massive child marriage problem. When we start sending SMSs and, and this information, it, there is a, like a big brother effect, like somebody is observing me and somebody is you know, texting me about my girl's attendance. We see that just simple SMS and CCD both have similar effect in reduction of child marriage in, 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 in that low, uh, poor community. And in northern part of Bangladesh, uh, the child marriage rate is very high. 38% child children got married before 17. So it's a very high child, prevalent, child marriage prevalent area, and then we saw a reduction. Um, so, so just to, uh, a quick uh, cost calculation. So we did a very rigorous cost estimates of these two effects. Now, if we do a simple actual cost estimate of SMS and CCT, because we had to send our enumerator team to collect data, so we had a bit of cost to collect the attendance information. So currently, the costs are pretty similar. But if you can imagine that we are automating the attendance record, then the SMS itself will be extremely cost-effective way of, of uh, generating effect. And in our, uh, because we varied the CCT amount, we found that about 30% uh, uh, of the local child labor maximum uh, CCT effect. <coughs> so the side-by-side -side comparison, um, uh, the CCT and SMS, except for the impact, all other dimensions, we see similar side-by-side -side effect between SMS and CCT. And, and so this is my last slide for the scale up. So one very uh, easy scaling up opportunity for um, ADB to consider is to digitize the attendance records, right? So if we can somehow create all these machines where schools, rural kids will come and they scan their uh, QR code, then these machines can generate a report and send SMS back to the families that will, be, that will be a very easy solution to, to generate the SMS effect, and then it, is, it will be easy to scale up. 
So this is something to, to uh, I'm happy to discuss and, and we are looking for uh, possible possibility for uh, you know scaling up opportunities to see whether we can reduce the, the friction between families and schools in a, in a more cost effective way. So, so with that, I, I would like to uh, conclude my, my session and thank you, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Abu Shan Choi, um, and the third uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Tong Ching Wang, the postdoctoral fellow from Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, she will share with us the long-term development impact um, of uh, the WASH program, which is the water and sanitation. Tong Ching, thank you. Uh, thank you, ADB and IEA, for recognizing our work. And I also would like to thank my course, Adi, for his contributions. And uh, my PhD supervisor, Hiroka Ishise, who motivated us to start this project. So this is the paper that we do not use RCTs, okay? So let me start presenting the paper. So, uh, this one. Okay, our paper uh, studies the long-term impact of public wash programs leveraging the staggered expansion of both toilet and water, water program in rural China. Okay, now let me start this one. Okay, as one of the sustainable development goals, it has been on national governments and international organizations' agendas to provide safe and equitable sanitation and water. However, up to 2023, 27% of the world's population still lacked safely managed drinking water, and 43% of still lacked safe and managed sanitation. Although the progress has been made, we are still lagging behind the SDGs 2030 targets by more than 50%. So this figure shows the population using safe and managed drinking water and sanitation. So you can see most countries, most countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and East Asia, they still lack such access. So the water programs in Lulu, China, which focus on both improving the sanitation and the drinking water over the last three decades provide us an invaluable experience. So this figure summarizes the change seen access to both the flush toilet and uh, drinking water uh, over the over last, de last 30 decades using uh, 181 villages. So you can see from 1989 to 2015, there's a huge increase in both the availability of flush toilet and drinking water. So actually, the fraction of household with flush toilet increased from 4% to over 60% uh, over last three, uh, less than three decades. So you would say that's a huge expansion. So the first program that we are focusing on is the, is the water plant program. But it start, uh, started since 1980s all the way to 2015. And it focused on improving water quality and building water plants within communities. So the total cost is about 12 billion US dollars, among which 60% is from the state. And the average cost is about 30 US dollars per capita. So the first figure is com the first figure comes from a Chinese county yearbook, shows you an example of water plant in the 1990s in Lulu, China. And the, the second figure shows the changes in household access to drinking water before and after the water program. So before the water program, most households, they were using the open wells or ground water to get access to drinking water. But afterwards, 80% of the household reported that they were using water plant to get drinking water. So the second program that we are focusing on is the toilet subsidy program. It started since 1990s, and it focused on providing rural households with one-time subsidies to upgrade or build a clean toilet. So the total cost is about 5 billion US dollars, among which 30% is from the state. And the average cost is about 81 US dollars per household. So the first figure shows you that the, the, government, the government officials was, retro, was inspecting the retrofitting of pit latrines in rural areas. 
And the second figure shows you the changes in household toilet facilities before and after the toilet program. So before the program, most households, they were using the open pit or non-flush toilet. But afterwards, also 80% of the households, they were they reporting that they were using the flush toilet, non, uh, either the automatic flush type or the manual flush type. So given the large scale and the duration of the Chinese programs, uh, we use this context to address some policy relevant gaps, which we believe could, could benefit policymakers. So first, we ask how does the worship programs affect individuals' later life social economic outcomes? So given the duration and implementation time period of recent public worship programs and uh, uh, past experimental trials, most studies talked about the uh, short-term short effects such as children's survival or their anthropometric outcomes. But we know that the benefit from worship programs is not just about health. We, we have many other uh, implications in terms of other outcomes which depend on the current health conditions. And also, we, there are good reasons to believe that the long-term impacts may actually differ from the short-run effect. One possible reason is so-called the behavior rigidity. So even though you provide the household with free access to sanitation, people may be tempted to go back to using the unsanitary toilet if the incentives were not strong enough for them to sustain their behavior change. And the second possible reason is, you know, the water networks and uh, the pipes, they may get aging or broken, which could mitigate the effect of water plants. So understanding such long-term impacts could inform policymakers about the optimal level of water investment. And the second point is, it's ambiguous whether water programs could not only improve the socioeconomic outcomes of exposed children, but also could break the intergenerational transmission of socioeconomic outcomes. So it could be ambiguous. You, you see, if the worship programs could primarily expand among the poor, it seems natural that it could reduce the intergenerational transmission. But on the other hand, if there are positive externalities within the same village, such as a disease reduction, so it could benefit everyone, not just the low-income household or the household with low levels of household with low levels of human capital. So, uh, and the last question we wish to address is whether uh, different or multiple worship components have complementarity effect or not. So. They could be complementary since effective sanitation program, sanitation uh, pro provision could prevent the contamination of water and the clean water could reduce the time spent on managing unsanitary toilet. But we still have limited, limited scientific consensus. But understanding such potential complementarity could inform policymakers to think about combining what interventions and how to combine different interventions when we are designing the most effective wash programs. So our study tries to fill in these gaps. So first, we look at their long-term impacts. And we always make sure the effect from one program are not driven by the, the other program. So first, uh, uh, this figure shows you the long-term impacts on children's educational attainment. And we see that both programs increase as children's years of schooling and the e effect were there over 20 years. And also the effect are larger for girls than for boys. But more importantly, the effects from toilet programs is larger than the effect from water programs. And we consistently find that the increase in children's uh, school attendance and their completing grade four age. So next, we are interested in the complementarities. And uh, we conducted two tests. First, in the red bus, we find that the increase in years of schooling are actually are, is, is much bigger in the villages that introduced the two programs together. And in the, second, in the second figure, we show the different effect by the age of water plant. And we find that 
the increase in years of schooling in the villages that introduced a toilet program within 10 years of the program within 10 years of the water program is consistent with our baseline result. But we find little evidence of significant effect in the villages that introduced the water program long before the toilet program. So from the first result, we know that the WASH programs could improve children's educational attainment. But now we are interested in the inequality of opportunities. And we find that actually the intergenerational persistence becomes weaker in the villages that introduced the toilet program. So basically, before the WASH programs, our children born to highly educated mother, they can go to high school, and the children born to poorly educated mother, they cannot go to high school. But after the toilet program, children born to less educated mother, now they can go to college, and their ranks are slightly higher than children born to less ed educated mothers. So having found this result, we are next interested in understanding the channels, how watch programs improve children's educational attainment. And then we find that actually the toilet program shifted adult occupation choice, enabling them to relocate from agricultural sector to manual and service sectors and increase their labor supply and income. This subsequently reduced the child labor. And for the water, water program, it improved the children's health conditions measured by the height for age index. So we believe our study has some specific policy implications and could provide suggestions for policymakers. So first, we find a larger effect from the toilet program than from the water program, suggesting that the improvement in sanitation on top of water is much more effective than just improving water. And second, we find some evidence on complementarities, suggesting that there could be a more efficient way to implement WASH programs, but we need to carefully think about when and where to distribute different intervention arms. And third, we find some uh, in, intergenerational effect. So WASH programs could break the link between mothers and children's social economic outcome transmission. So it means so WASH programs could be another policy tool to consider when we are thinking about reducing the inequality of opportunities across generations. So given and combining the recent concern about climate change, which is predicted to increase the severity and the frequency of vector bone and water bone diseases, now I'm going to, uh, I'm going to talk a little about uh, our ongoing work. So since the effective worship programs could mitigate the transmission of waterborne diseases, we think it is of importance to policymakers who we would like to cooperate more to think about or to design the public wash systems to be more salient to climate change. Also to use the wash services to mitigate the, the damages from climate change. So as we are interested in uh, improving the design of worship pro programs, why don't we start from some small experimental settings which could be tailored to your country's settings. So we are very happy to cooperate designing the most effective worship programs and learn from the policymakers. So please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tongqing. Um, uh, and the next one will be, uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Manny Himanis, uh, Director General of ADB Independent Evaluation Department, to share with us um, uh, his reflections on how ADB could incorporate the research findings into our operations. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Akapon. And, and, uh, Thanks again uh, to our three researchers uh, for a terrific set of presentations that is the culmination of a, a lot of work. Uh, before I reflect on uh, possible operational implications of uh, this work, uh, I realized that I did not do something that you asked me to act upon, and that is to mention uh, those who almost won the award but didn't quite, and these are the honorable mentions. So can I just ask, uh, 
Okay. So, um, I'd like to uh, uh, say that in addition to the three winners, the selection committee acknowledged uh, outstanding contributions to seven papers uh, that uh, didn't quite make the cut because there was a budget constraint. We're all, we're economists here. Uh, and let me just mention them. And then uh, just for the record, I'd like you to acknowledge them with a round of applause. So there was global gains from a, uh, from a green energy transition, evidence on coal-fired power and air quality uh, dissatisfaction, another paper on the double-edged sword, the unintended consequences of SME promotion policy, a third paper on access to information, uh, technology adoption and productivity, large-scale evidence from agriculture in India, a fourth paper on sacrifice for the greater good, welfare and distributional impacts of flood detention basins in China, a fifth paper on early childhood human capital formation at scale, a sixth paper on long-run impacts of growth and development monitoring, evidence from routine health experiments in early childhood, and finally, the long-term impact of in utero exposure to natural disasters, evidence from the 2010 Pakistan flood. So please join me in a round of applause for the honorable mention. Uh, so I, uh, Akapana asked me to uh, make some reflections on how to operationalize this. And I, I have to say that I'm not speaking for ADB operations. I'm not able to because I'm <coughs> an independent evaluator. I think it's mostly because, uh, well, I'm, I'm uh, uh, older and I uh, have had a lot of experience. Uh, in half of my development career, I was in fact uh, a researcher uh, and then moved into operations uh, for, in which I was actually implementing programs that uh, were trying to improve uh, outcomes like were mentioned by the uh, researchers, especially on the social sectors, and now I'm evaluating them. Uh, and I have to say that uh, these are, in general, papers that are potentially of great operational relevance, not just in the ADB, but uh, in uh, other multilateral development banks, so I worked in the World Bank for 30 years, and I can tell you that uh, they are indeed relevant. Uh, in the ADB, about 5% of all uh, operations uh, are on education, are trying to improve education outcomes, which all three papers here uh, have uh, made a statement on. Uh, there have been about almost $19 billion in loans and grants since 1970, and about 270 projects. And I think that in the future, ADB has ambitions to scale this up to uh, almost double to six to 10% of its lending operations. So these ideas are in fact going to be uh, relevant. That said, um, you know, my experience in uh, looking at uh, doing rigorous research and then trying to translate them into operations is not always a straightforward task for uh, a, no a number of, uh, of reasons. Uh, it's very true that there are now a lot more rigorous impact evaluations, not just RCTs, but also the kinds of work that was done on, on the WASH program, uh, which was very rigorously done uh, using the latest, uh, latest techniques. When you were all still in, in grade school, uh, there were about 10 to 15 of these evaluations being done for a year <coughs> worldwide. Uh, this is from based on the 3IE International Impact uh, Initiative for Impact Evaluation Database of all the impact evaluations in the development world that you can uh, cite online, uh, which uh, I used to head 3IE. Uh, and now there are about three or 400 being done a year. So there's a lot more evidence out there. And uh, the question is, if there are such good ideas, uh, why aren't they being used uh, in the kinds of uh, work that is being done regularly? Well, in fact, many of them are. We just perhaps don't know it. But there are also a number of reasons why uh, uh, they're, they're, they are a challenge to, to implement. And uh, what I'm really happy about is all three papers uh, try to address these challenges. Uh, one is uh, the whole question of internal versus external validity. Uh, th there's a, a sense that you, you can do great case studies in a very rigorous way internally. The question is, are they valid in other contexts? And uh, um, when I, uh, 
presented a paper uh, 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 that Claire presented, you know, tried to use the same intervention in a variety of countries. And I think that uh, really tries to uh, address uh, that issue. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, um, uh, the, the other two papers also uh, had uh, uh, projects in, in quite, different, quite different settings. Uh, so I, I think these papers try to address this question of uh, internal versus external validity uh, uh, well. The other uh, is that, look, these projects are, tend to be pilot, especially if they're randomized control trials, and they're small. Uh, what happens when they're big? Do you get the same effects? Uh, and uh, the paper on WASH, for example, in fact, this is already a scaled-up program that you're evaluating, and, and that's great. Uh, I know that in, in Claire's paper especially, uh, it's true that uh, what's really nice is that uh, you try to uh, have these uh, pilots uh, implemented not just by NGOs, or by researchers themselves, as is sometimes done, uh, but by governments themselves. Because another concern that people have is, well, it's all very well when uh, you have these interventions that are being implemented uh, in a small way by a dedicated team of really uh, ambitious researchers. So they really implement the programs well. It's no longer the real world. It's almost like a laboratory. But in this case, I think you're trying to address that, uh, which is uh, uh, great. And finally, all three papers address, I think, what is a critical issue, and that's cost effectiveness. Uh, in the projects that uh, we looked at at 3IE, of these 5,000 impact evaluations, only a very small number uh, looked at the cost of doing these evaluations relative to the effect sizes that researchers often focus on. Uh, and for that reason, I think that uh, there is more of a chance uh, that, uh, that these uh, projects uh, will actually be uh, implemented. I also like the fact that uh, uh, it's cross-sectoral. Uh, uh, I would hope, uh, Dong King, that in the future, uh, ADB's uh, uh, water and sanitation projects will actually be able to say we have effects not just on health, but on education outcomes. And therefore, it might actually tip the balance on whether or not these things are, are being funded. So I think that uh, uh, I think it's better for you than to ask the researchers yourselves some of these questions. But those are just some of my reflections on why I think that these papers have great promise in actually being able to affect how we are try, uh, going to be moving forward in uh, helping poor people in the region. Thank you. Thank you, DT Manny. Um, now the floor open for you know, Q&A. Uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, any questions uh, that you may have to our speakers. Um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, Albert? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, do we have a microphone? Thanks a lot. Uh, great presentations. I really enjoy them. I had one question for each of you. Um, so uh, uh, for Claire, do you think there's any value for this type of intervention even when there isn't an emergency, this teaching to the right level and using mobile phones? I'm just curious if you've thought about testing that or, or have any thoughts even if you haven't tested that. And then for the second presentation, um, I'm wondering if you feel that one of the reasons you didn't find this big difference in loss versus gain framing is that you didn't actually give them the money and that you created this virtual account, which maybe they didn't really feel was really their money yet. And in the last presentation, uh, this type of design is very similar. It's been used many times, you know, all the way back to Esther Duflo's job market paper on school construction projects. And one of the concerns of the design is that, you know, if the government is building, um, making these investments in, in villages, they're often also making other investments. Maybe they're improving schools or improving other infrastructure. So I'm just curious if you've been able to test whether there aren't other types of things going on at the same time as, as uh, these interventions that you're studying. 
Okay. Perhaps uh, we collect a few more questions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the lady. Oh, hi. I'm Purnima Menon with the International Food Policy Research Institute. Fantastic to see all your work very close to our hearts, really. Uh, so I, I did have a question both for Abu and for Dong, Dong Chin. Hopefully I, I said that right. Um, a little similar to what Albert was saying, are these also places where you have uh, school meals in place, you know, especially in, in the China setting, is, are you also able to kind of phase in potential introduction of school meal programs and the, um, be able to look at the synergistic effects of that as well? Thanks. Okay, and we have one more question from gentlemen. Uh, hello, my name is Elisa Zikalauri. I'm from Georgian State University. Uh, now I'm part of the uh, Young uh, Delegates Organization. Um, my question is uh, next. First of all, I'm glad to see you there because that's the first time uh, that uh, uh, ADB is uh, in Georgia and it's too um, much pleasure for us. Um, uh, I'm interested uh, in uh, your uh, in the program. Um, in our country, uh, um, 30, uh, from 20 percent of um, demogra uh, demigration uh, uh, population uh, is um, uh, cultural, uh, ethnic mi uh, minorities. Uh, cultural differences is uh, is uh, so um, problematic uh, in every country, and I'm interested in uh, how uh, what mechanism is uh, to um, head this problem uh, and help them uh, to integrate uh, in uh, your countries, uh, and also this program how um, uh, touch them like. Sorry for my uh, nerves. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question from the floor. Uh, maybe I will invite uh, the speakers, you know, to respond uh, some of the questions. Maybe start from Claire, Abu, and Dongxin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, in Albert's question, um, does this this uh, phone-based maths program likely to work outside emergency context? I guess my hunch is that. It's unusually relevant in an emergency context when a lot of other options are closed off, but there's no reason why that can't also apply outside emergencies. So we're still seeing like very high uptake when we're working in Botswana now. So most households who are offered this say yes. Um, and we're working with DepEd in Philippines who's rolling this out in the national, like in the school year, just as a regular part of remedial education. So yeah, I definitely think so. Um, um, thank you. Um, Albert, um, yes, um, I mean, we admit that we could not probably produce the endowment effect for the families. And then as, as a result of the, I mean, two blocks, one from IRB and one from the ministry, we couldn't do it. But I mean, one way to, you know, revisit it, like whether there is an innovative way to create the endowment effect or we can really give them uh, like a bank account balance sheet or something probably could create that. But we, we admit that that we, it is a failure of uh, creating an endowment effect. That's why we didn't see much effect. Uh, for Pur Purnima, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, our the schools that we have uh, selected for the study, it they have an active school meal program. Yeah, so that's why the the re reason we wanted to have two different attendance record because many kids will come in the morning and after the lunch they will leave, and and or, or, or play. So we wanted to make sure that not only they're coming for the meal they stay uh, in the school and and for your question related to ethnic minorities I, I actually don't have any answer because uh, the the setting where we did the study people I mean they, that population is pretty homogeneous uh, so I actually won't be able to say much about it but I'm happy to talk with you after after the the session thank you uh, thank you for the questions. So I think the, these two questions uh, is quite similar. So uh, first, uh, 
uh, in our uh, basic strategy, we also control for the uh, city level educa uh, education institutions and education levels, but because we don't have the data for the village level. And also, we use another strategy, we use cohort difference in difference. In that strategy, we, uh, we are able to control for the village level education because we use the census data in China. And also in terms of the school, uh, school, meal, school meals policies, I think they have, uh, recently they have two papers, I think, already published about the school meal policies. I think they should have the, they, they have the data about the school meals in villages in China. Maybe we can collect that data and cooperate that in our specifications to check the robustness check. Um, and. Uh, um, by the way, I think also another thing about it is about the uh, school toilet provision uh, programs, such as because you know some countries they uh, launched this kind of school toilet programs, but in China, I think. Uh, they could, they have some such uh, programs in school, so to improve the sanitation or the water, but we, but unfortunately we don't have that kind of data to check uh, whether it uh, it's also have some impacts on the to, on children's education or health. Yes, thank you. May I check if there are any uh, questions from the floor? Uh, okay, please. Hello, I represent my own company, but meanwhile, I'm a researcher, active PhD, working on my complexion, completion of PhD paper, which is aimed at um, and which is focusing on transition processes in developing countries on the example of Georgia. And the most important um, topic, there is knowledge-based development. I should uh, thank the ADB department, which works so hard. I didn't know this direction. And uh, the topics were very interesting. And we see that all three topics are aimed to the poverty reduction through the knowledge-based development. Um, interesting is the third topic, um, which is very in complex complexity refers to the psychological factor, we should say. Besides hygiene, there is a <clears throat> psychological factor. I know that you know that. And this kind of research, which is done through financial interesting, financial interest loss and profit, it's so much interesting. And the first topic is amazing. The only thing, I have a technical question, if it's possible, I know that you are working very deeply there. We know that internet connection and telephone, I mean, um, there is a low income problem in Africa, we know that. And, I, and is there included distribution of these telephones or some gadgets in these programs? How do you deal with that? Because besides low income, they don't, not everybody has got telephone and there should be families which are interested in education. So do you include distribution of some funds or gadgets to the families or children? Thank you. One, one more question. Yeah. Thank you very much for very interesting uh, research uh, findings that you guys presented. My question is from Professor Claire. Um, the, in terms of emergencies uh, and disasters, they are normally defined by the duration when the emergency, you know, st stops uh, or finishes and recovery begins. Um, but in situations where the emergencies or complex humanitarian conditions continue for long periods of time and the emergency is not over, uh, and because you're working in Afghanistan as well, taking that as an example, where education, modern education is systemically uh, or systematically um, prevented. So how does the program that you, you guys taken uh, what is your insight about a success in those kind of situations particularly in the context of Afghanistan if you can share your experience and findings thank you very much okay. thank you um, okay if no further question uh, maybe I invite um, uh, Claire uh, 
Um, sure. Thank you. Thanks fun. so much for those questions. Um, so on phone access, no. I guess if we provided phones, that would massively blow out the cost effectiveness. And so it did. That was the joy of it. Is it was very nimble and very cheap. And like the average phone subscription in most of these countries is like over one per person. So that's most households have a phone. Um, so we got phone numbers from schools typically and everybody had to have at least somebody's phone number listed. So it was fine if it was like your neighbor down the street or your uncle in the same village as you. So everybody had access to a, a feature phone. So that was the joy of this one compared to like higher tech, maybe app-based kind of education programs. Uh, and then on the emergencies situation, yeah, um, it'd be great to talk to you more, but we're in the early days of, of Afghanistan support. We're working a lot in Ethiopia as well in Somalia to see if we're very early stage there, seeing if it can work in like Tigray and Oromia. So I guess what we're discovering is that still, again, a lot of households do have phones. People can be uh, a little more hesitant, so I think it's really important to be uh, working with like local organizations that know communities very well. Um, I guess in the like longer term displacement situation, uh, yeah, when it's taking a longer time for like organizations to come in and provide these like catch up clubs and like remedial situations, I guess phone based programs, people are usually taking phones with them. And so even if there are other complementary education programs being delivered, this phone tutoring can kind of reach people where they are. That's one other uh, benefit of this program that people had mentioned to us is like in a pastoral setting when like boys are going out for a large period of time um, to take care of their animals, um, they have phones with them typically. And so this can also stop that kind of disruption. Um, but yeah, early days in all of these like conflict settings. Um, and then in the Philippines, I guess the government uh, DEPED and then Bar in BARM are keen to see if this can work when schools are closed for like typhoon related um, emergencies. Okay, thank you. I think we are running out of time. Uh, we have a very productive discussion. I hope we have more time. Um, we can continue to discuss, I think, after the session. Um, in closing, um, I would like to invite Mr. Albert Park, um, Chief Economist and Director General of Economic Research and Development Impact Department uh, to deliver the closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, I want to take this opportunity to once again congratulate our three winners, uh, Claire Cullen, Abu Sanchoy, and Dongqin Wang, and their co-authors for winning uh, or being recognized for the, in the 2024 ADB IEA Innovative Policy Research Award for really excellent research contributions to policy formation that addresses some of the evolving development challenges facing the Asia and Pacific region. So congratulations again. So earlier this month, we uh, released our updated uh, projections for the economic outlook for Asia and the Pacific. And uh, we find that the prospects uh, in terms of economic opportunity are still quite robust and positive. Our projections for growth this year and next year are 4.9%, which is uh, similar to pre-pandemic levels. Um, and moreover, the region really showed a lot of resilience uh, to large global shocks, both in terms of the pandemic, but then also <coughs> high commodity prices, inflation, elevated interest rates. Um, and we're still seeing kind of a continued recovery and a, con a return to normalcy to the dynamism that we've seen really for decades in, in the region. However, at the same time, uh, we do know that there are still very important development challenges that confront the region. Uh, a lot of countries, a lot of governments are now turning their attention back to more of the middle and long-term growth and development issues, including how to catch up on the progress towards the SDGs, also climate change. Um, and so I was very uh, delighted to see that uh, the winning papers this year all addressed uh, issue, uh, a really important SDG, which is uh, education. Um, and it's an issue that our research department has also really been focusing on. Uh, even before the pandemic, we had a learning crisis in many countries in the Asia Pacific region, very poor learning outcomes that really, of course, are, are, are a major development challenge in the medium to long term. Um, and 
uh, we've also been studying uh, what happened during the pandemic in terms of learning loss and learning recovery. And uh, we can confirm from our own meta-analysis that these efforts to target uh, teaching at the right level, really there's a lot of now strong evidence that this is an effective way um, to teach. So uh, we recognize more generally that a closer connection between economic research and ADB operations and policy form formulation are really critical for driving the development region and uh, as someone who's kind of uh, moved from academics to uh, being at ADB uh, that has been a major shift that we really and, and I do this when I uh, speak at academic conferences I really try to nudge academic researchers also to think about the relevance of the questions that they're asking for the really current pressing challenges uh, that we really need knowledge um, contributions on and I think all these three papers are, provide very timely and useful um, information that can inform policy. So the ADB IEA Innovative Policy Research Award is really trying to serve as a collaborative mechanism that can translate the cutting edge economic research into effective policy formulation to address the development challenges in the Asia and the Pacific. Um, and so the new ideas recognized by the award can help not only to advance the region's development, but also guide ADB in maximizing development impact of its operations, with some of the caveats that Manny mentioned, of course, uh, still needing to be uh, kept in mind. Um, and this type of innovative upstream work to engage in policy dialogue with its developing member countries um, and then ADB can also leverage its own comparative advantage uh, to convene relevant stakeholders, <coughs> conduct high-level policy dialogue, and offer impactful operations and knowledge products and services, and so make uh, innovative ideas more impactful in real-world practice. So uh, in conclusion and closing uh, today's session, I want to thank everybody involved in making this competition a success. Um, and also in making this event today a success. Um, of course, we have our three presenters who had very excellent presentations. I want to thank all of the people who submitted papers to the competition. Um, and finally, uh, I want to give a special thanks to the selection committee members and the IEA and ADB teams who managed the entire process. So thank you very much. Thank you. I want to join Albert in thanking all of you for participating uh, in ADB IEA Innovative Policy Sessions. Um, this session comes to a close, and I hope to see you again next year in Milan. Thank you.